the west coast of North America was shifted 60 degrees further west to, it, uh, to its approximate uh, accurate location. And I mean, you don't do that if you haven't got immediate um, accurate information. That's why it's so exciting to be part of revisionist history, because we actually get to go back and look and ask the question instead of just ingesting information like automatons. Yeah, well, well of course, is you know, somebody once said that um, you, you know the history is written by the victors. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, I think and that's so you true. Get, you get the um, yeah. I had a debate with somebody about that the other day when I pointed out. Um, in, in fact, it was one of our provincial leaders here a few years ago. I had the argument with him, and I said, you know, I would much rather have been a medieval peasant under feudalism than uh, living under your jurisdiction today. <laughs> and, God, uh, that's pretty uh, heavy. Luckily, well, luckily <laughs> he had a sense of humor, but um, uh, which is rare for no. Anyway. Um, he, um, uh, he said, what, what are you talking about? And I said, well, you know, we've been led to believe that being a feudal peasant was terrible. But I said, you know, I work for the government uh, five, almost six days of the week. I um, mean, how, how long into June or July is it before you're, you're, the money you make is not going to Washington any, anymore? It's staying in your pocket. And I, and I said, uh, you know, the, 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 the feudal peasant only had to work four days a week on average for the Lord of the Manor and got in return for that uh, protection and defense, which of course is what federal governments actually are only all about, but not only that, but the the, fe- the medieval peasant had a hundred days of holidays a year. Let's go to Europe. You get, I think, a month or six weeks, isn't it? That's really being human, isn't it? Yes, of course. But uh, as I say, that the, the the medieval peasant got at least a hundred days of holidays a year because they were religious holidays. And and the the uh, you know the uh, Lord of the Manor didn't dare uh, argue with the Church, and uh, so as I say, when you start to compare things, but we're led to this idea that um, being a you know a, a worker in the Industrial Revolution was a much more enlightened and free life than being a medieval peasant, when it, it's far from the truth. We're living in a very very different world today. Well, words. exactly, and, and it's because you, you, you know, it's as I said, it's, it's what they what they mean when they say the victor's right. We, we've got to convince ourselves that what we're doing today is far better or and superior to anything that went on in the past, and uh, that's not the case at all. But uh, you have to to open your mind up, as we were discussing earlier, and start to look at these things from a different perspective. And um, and of course, what happens is, as, as I say about our education system today, it's not education; it's indoctrination. That's a really key distinction. Yeah, and and student students once they um, regurgitate what they've been told, uh, then they're given an A, and the student that dares to question is given a C or an F or seen as a troublemaker. And um, I, I, it, it, I I always used to laugh about it. I, I said my favorite students are the ones that sit in the back row. Because because they're sitting back there with a cynical ear, and that's what I want in my classroom. And uh, so, and I, but I used to tell them, don't get too cynical. Just keep it a healthy skepticism, and we can get along. Why is it that those who roll up their sleeves and do their own investigations and their own research on things, who are dedicated, why are they called skeptics? Well, there's two, two, two answers to that. The first is that if you're a scientist, you are, you are by your very training, a skeptic, because a, a scientist questions everything. Okay. But of course, of, of course, this is one of the things that shows, and the other side of it, is how I knew that, that climate science was now political climate science, because they started labeling me a, labeling me a skeptic. And um, I said, but all, sci- all scientists are skeptics. Uh, but somehow, being a climate skeptic was unacceptable. And of course, it's because you're questioning the prevailing wisdom. You're, you're questioning the power. And you're questioning uh, those people that want to control you with the information that they have. There's another piece to this, which is that we are supposed to accept what we're being told. but We're told we're deniers. It's kind of like saying so-and-so can't face reality or you disenfranchise them or you make them wrong or you detach from them, disassociate from them. They're crazy. 
that kind of rhetoric, that kind of communication is totally inappropriate. And the fact that there's no dialogue, that the dialogue is over, there has never been a dialogue yet. And the minute that there is a dialogue and the people come out of hiding about this, believe me, more people are going to question, do their own research instead of blindly going along. Very important. I'd like to talk about the Gulf Coast with you if you have a little more time. Yes, absolutely. And and by the way, just a quick comment about what you just said. Uh, It's the marginalizing, because we're we're the gregarious animal. We, We are much more comfortable in groups. We want to be part of a group. And, and, of course, uh, if you can marginalize somebody, that shun them from the group. I mean, shunning is one of the most standard techniques of uh, pushing somebody outside and, and marginalizing them. And, of course, we saw that in the climate debate, not only in terms of, of the, the – um, there's, no, there's no debate, there's no dialogue, but also in the consensus argument. The consensus argument doesn't work in science. That, um, you know, that uh, consensus is not a scientific fact, as I've said many times. But if you could say, well, and as that woman said to you, well, no, you're, are you disagreeing with the 20,000 scientists? What she's essentially doing is saying, well, you, you're, you're marginalized. You're, you're so outside of the group. You can't possibly be right. But there's more scientists outside the IPCC that totally don't agree with most of what they're saying. And that is never brought to light. Why? Well, that's never brought to light. But one, one of the reasons I haven't used it, um, because, yeah, I was one of the first signers of the Oregon petition and all these different petitions, the Heidelberg uh, petition and so on. But the difficulty is that um, it, it, it's not proof either. Oh, I totally agree with you. It's like having the wrong conversation because it's not about this versus that. It's about what is the science. What is the purpose of the science? Yes. And, and, and so, um, yeah, you, you can say, well, there's this many scientists that disagree with the IPCC, but that doesn't make the science any, right or, any more right or wrong. That's correct. And that's why I didn't get into the conversation, but I thought it was interesting because even on that level, it's a non-conversation to be having, really. But you can't know that until you've heard somebody like you and Joe Dalio and Robert Felix talk about all these different areas of what scientists are supposed to do. God, there was a lot of people that I had on who were scientists that talked about how the science has always been done until now it's being critically obstructed. And the whole thing about understanding the difference between simulations and real data, fascinating. Totally different gestalts of information. That's a whole other world. You know, this whole ocean thing is really speaking to that. Because, because we know virtually nothing about the oceans, and yet they are, they are essential to understanding uh, the whole atmospheric system, the climate system, the weather patterns we get, and so on. And so when you start to look at, I mean, we just talked about um, the, the surface currents and so on, but how many people know that, there are, that below that approximately 3,000 feet, the ocean circulations are completely different? What you've got is uh, essentially um, the cold water, the cold, dense water, and in the polar regions, sinks because it's cold and dense, and then moves towards the equator where it rises. So it's going in a a, a circulation system that is essentially north-south, whereas most of the ocean currents on the surface are uh, circulating around ocean basins in what are called gyres. And so when we talked about the Gulf Stream and, and it going up and becoming the North Atlantic Drift, well, that it goes up into the Arctic Ocean, but also a large portion of it goes back down along the coast of, of West Africa and, um, and down around and back across the ocean again. So these circulations within each ocean basin, um, as I said, are called gyres or gyres. That's spelled G-Y-R-E-S. And uh, so you've got two distinctly different patterns of circulation in the ocean, that surface pattern driven by the winds, and then you've got the very deep ocean circulation. And so, of course, what could happen, because water can store um, heat 
uh, in very, very large quantities for very long periods of time, you can have um, 